Right. Hey, folks. So today we're going to be talking about um, what makes a good client. So I had this really interesting question from one of my regular clients, TJ. Um, I've been coaching TJ for about a year. And in that time, he's gone through a lot of really cool life changes. So he's got himself promoted. He's moved out from home. And he's at that point in his life where he's at that crossroads of, okay, I used to be younger, living at home. And now I'm transitioning into being a fully fledged adult who has his own bills and all that kind of stuff. And it's a really interesting transition. And obviously you want to know how to navigate it in the best possible way. You want to know how to navigate your work life, your relationships, right? The uh, Baz lifts manosphere pending, but you also want to know what can I do to better myself in the gym? What can I do to get the greatest results possible? And it's an obvious question. So I, he asked me and I thought about it for a while and I gave him this answer, which I'm about to detail in this video. And I think, first of all, it's generally not the group of people who you might think it is. Like it's not the young guys who are without any significant responsibilities, like no kids. They're still at the beginning rung of their job career. And yeah, it's actually not those guys who you would consider to be the ones who are most receptive to training. Like the ones who just don't have a great deal on their plate yet. Guys in their early 20s. Yeah, it's actually not them. So over the course of this video, what I want to do is I want to talk about the profile of the most high achieving clients that I've typically seen over the course of 10 years. And, and listen, you might disagree, but this is my experience. This is what I've seen. This is what I've observed. And then I want to speak about what can we learn from that group of people. All right. So firstly, the best client's profile. Contrary to what you might think, it's not the people with the least responsibilities. It's actually the people with the most responsibilities. That's who I've consistently seen as the best clients. So these are the guys who wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. They've got very, very busy, demanding jobs. So they're at the gym before they go to work. They've prepped their food. They arrive at work 7 or 8 o'clock and they have a busy day ahead of them. And when they go home, they've got kids to look after. They've got a wife to spend time with. They've got responsibilities, stuff to do around the house, all that kind of thing. Those tend to be the guys who actually tend to have the best results because those are the ones who tend to be able to stick to the plan, which sounds completely counterintuitive because one would assume people with the least responsibilities would tend to be the ones who have the most time to devote to the gym. The actuality is it's not the case. The guys who tend to be the busiest are the ones who know how to incorporate many different things into their life. The guys who don't have that experience, just a whole bunch of factors get in the way. And that's what this video is about. I'm going to name off all these factors, which can help you with your bodybuilding lifestyle. So first thing is time management. Really, really crucial thing. Something which I do a lot as well. With a lot of these high achieving clients, a lot of the discussion is about how to fit things in. And um, I'll give you an example. What I do is every Sunday, I sit down and I plan out my week. I plan out one of the major pinch points in the week, like when am I going to be the busiest? And I make sure I've got time to do what I need to do. So let's say I've got a standard week, but I've got some appointments. I need to meet people, I need to talk about things. Perhaps I'm on a guest on a podcast. I need to account for all these things. So this week, I know I've got three additional things to do, which are going to take quite a lot of time. I've already accounted for those. I've made time for those and I've shifted things around so that I can get everything done and most importantly, not worry about it. Everything is written down as a list, my day-to-day -day tasks, my weekly tasks, and that has two advantages, okay? The first advantage is, obviously, I don't miss anything. The second advantage is, I don't worry. I don't worry that I'm going to miss something. That's important too, because the worry can take time. And not, not to be too harsh on people, but where I've seen people really do this wrong is it gets to the end of the week, they've not meal prepped, they don't have food ready, and that's it. <laughs> Friday begins junk day because they didn't have food ready, so they just went out to McDonald's, Burger King, whatever, and then that's it. It's, it's all a wash. And you think to yourself, well, why did we get to Friday? Like, why did that? Why was that allowed to happen? Why did you not have food ready? Oh, because I forgot to prep on Wednesday. Like, Okay, hold on. Oh, because I ran out of food Wednesday. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> but why, <laughs> why didn't you plan to prep more on Wednesday? Like, you should have known this at the start of the week. Like, oh, yeah, I should have planned it. Like, well, yes. So it's simple fixes. And I think the big takeaway from the first point is 
plan out your week, plan out your day, make sure you know what you're going to hit. Now, for those people who have like a regular nine to five, it's a little bit simpler, maybe, because at least your work day is planned out. Your boss tells you what to do, blah, 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 right? You do have the rest of the week to contend with, like you have your meal prep, spending time with the wife, spending time with the kids, all that kind of stuff. You have all that to contend with, of course, but at least some of your day is accounted for. For the entrepreneurs out there, it's wise to list out what you're going to do to make sure you get it done and you don't worry about missing things. Okay? It, just, it just makes me feel a lot more relaxed that I've got a list of things which I know I need to do. Okay? And if somebody asks me to do something and it's not on my list, well, you can be sure it's not getting done because uh, I don't have such a good memory. <laughs> so, so that's the first thing, time management. Make sure you're on the right side of that. The next thing is emotions and productivity. Now, uh, I've kind of had a bit of banter about this in the past and put on blast people who get shouty and angry on YouTube. And I think that sort of caricature of the, the angry guy shouting at the cloud is, is all very funny. We all like to take part in that. We all love Homer Simpson, for example, and George Costanza. But I would never want to be a real life Homer Simpson or George Costanza, right? They're fun to laugh at, but and they, they're endearing. They're so emotional, but to actually be that kind of person would be very chaotic. And I think to be that way bleeds into other areas in life. So if you are overly emotional and that's how you make the majority of your decisions, I think that bleeds into a lot of things. I think typically those people are the ones who struggle with getting things done. But also, in my experience, typically those people also struggle with their own personal self-care, like eating the right foods. They tend to struggle with diet because they're emotional about food decisions. Yeah, I'm really motivated. I had a good week. And then all of a sudden is the weekend. I'm tired. I'm depressed. I'm going to eat the donuts. It's, it's a very typical thing I've seen over the years. Because as, as a coach, you're in a unique situation where you work with these people on a one-to-one -one basis and you do spot trends. And the ones who I've seen who are overly emotional, almost every single time they tend to struggle with diet because they just have an emotional way of dealing with things. Like it's always the, the really angry, shouty guys who have the problems with food continuously over years and decades. It's like, don't try to deal with everything in an emotional way. Take your emotions out of it. So do what you need to do over the course of the day. Don't let your emotions get in the way. People have asked me in the past on Q and A's, what do you do if you're sad and depressed on a day? <laughs> Well, you go, I go to the gym when I'm sad and depressed. I eat my food when I'm sad and depressed. I do my check-ins when I'm sad and depressed. I do YouTube when I'm sad and depressed. But you guys are never going to tell that because I'm a professional. Like, I get it done. I put on a smile and I get it done. So you have to adopt the same attitude with the rest of the things in life. Adopt a pleasant, amiable mood, but be a savage. Like, that's how it's done. That is workplace politics in a nutshell like you've got to represent yourself you've got to get the best out of yourself you can't run around being overly emotional all the time it doesn't serve you so be disciplined get it done you wouldn't phone in sick because you're feeling a bit tired that just get it done it's the same with diet same with meal prep don't be that guy who just ties everything to emotion your emotions will fuck you leave them out of it just get done what needs to be done and what's on your list. So the next thing is adaptability. Now, the ability to adapt to different circumstances, but also changes in the plan is super important. Now, not to be harsh and too critical, but the worst examples of this I've seen have been when there are changes to say cardio that needs to be done or workout length or food prep. And people just come back with, I don't have time to do that. Like, so wait a second. We've tagged on 20 minutes of cardio and you don't have time to do that. Yeah, I, I, I don't wake up that early. Like, well, wake up 20 minutes earlier, motherfucker. Like, what, what, what is that? Like, I don't even understand. That's something which doesn't even come into my mind. Like, if I had to do something to accomplish the goals which I had set for myself, I wouldn't just turn around and go, well, no, I, I don't wake up at that time. I would wake up 20 minutes earlier to achieve the goal. Like, it's a no-brainer to me. That entire conversation is a non-starter. And that's the point of adaptability. If you can change your schedule to get something done, then get it done. And don't get hung up on the sleep thing, because obviously sleep is important. But the point is, you can adapt your schedule to get things done. 
And I think the worst case scenarios of this are people who, as soon as they're confronted with a bit of a change in either circumstances or plan, they just crumble. Go up, you know what, fires, I've started on night shifts. That's it. It's all going to hell. Hey, come on. Typically speaking, those people, they're not planning out their weeks. They are thinking with their emotions. So it goes back to the first two points. Plan out your week. Think with your head. Don't always think with your heart. All right? Because that has, that's a double-edged uh, sword there. And make sure that you are willing to take on board changes. If you have a change of circumstances, if there's a change in the plan, if you have to add in some cardio or do meal prep a couple times a week, fine, get it done. Be adaptable. If there's a change of circumstances, change of plan, roll with the punches. It's not a big deal. Get it done. And the final thing I want to talk about is this theory of willpower and how to improve your willpower. Something which um, psychologists used to believe is that willpower was a finite resource. You make all the right decisions, start the day, and slowly by the end of the day, you tire out, your willpower starts to wane, and then you binge, you purge, right? You, but the more recent evidence that we have on willpower, and certainly my experience, is that willpower is a trainable factor. It's, it's more like a car battery. The more you use it, the more it regenerates itself. It's not a finite resource. No, no, it's continuously regenerating. And I think something that I've seen personally is the stronger that I've been on myself, the better I am over the long term to continue to do the right things. For example, there's a question on Reddit once um, a couple of weeks back, which was, what do you do on the days that you feel like you're not ready to really hit the diet hard? And my reply was, you double down on the diet on that day to make a point to yourself. You, <laughs> you don't take it easier on that day. You double down on yourself, particularly if it's the start of the diet, to make sure you are reinforcing the right habits. Because in, in my experience, Willpower is an illusion. It's more about what are you used to doing and the path of least resistance. So if you've been a junk food addict 20, 30 years, it's going to be that much harder to retrain yourself to good habits. And if every like day or every five minutes, you're constantly dipping back into the old habits that you're trying to get yourself rid of, all you're doing is reinforcing the old habits. And you know what? The old habits have got 20 years of experience. The new habits which you're trying to succeed in need more time to be nurtured. So willpower is a trainable factor. And the more you are willing to do something, the more you're willing to go to the gym, um, the more you're willing to prep your food, the easier it becomes. And after a while, the more you enjoy it. People ask me now, I go to the gym six days a week. People ask me, oh, you must have really good willpower. Not really. I drink water because I need to. I brush my teeth because I need to. I go to the gym because I need to. It is what it is. That's, that's not willpower to me. It never gets easy, but it's just a thing that gets done. This is something which I couldn't say for myself 10, 15 years ago, particularly in the realms of diet. I was much more lax with my diet, but the stricter I've become with diet, and even when I start a diet, I don't tend to start it in a relaxed, easy manner. I tend to go hard and go strict, and that tends to reinforce the good habits because I'm still fighting decades of poor dietary habits. So I'm just, I reinforce those good habits, and it, it just makes me feel like I have more willpower. So the takeaway of this final section is willpower is a trainable factor. You don't need to be treated every day. The more you do something and the more you're able to do it without breaks, the better it becomes, the easier it becomes. Okay. Now, in conclusion, I thought this was a really interesting chance for me to give you guys a bit of my life experience. I've been a coach for 10 years coached a ton of clients now, and I've managed to see commonalities in what makes these clients really, really good. But also through my own life experience of becoming a man, a trained person in the adult workforce, I've been, I've been trying to share with you some of my experience of what makes the FAS of 2023 much more efficient and determined and able to get things done than the FAS of 2005, for example. So. Hopefully that sort of life experience and coaching experience has been helpful for you guys in this video. And I would like to hear from you guys. What has your experience been with getting the job done? What has your experience been with actually being able to stick to a routine? What are the factors which you feel you struggle with? I think it's quite a vulnerable thing to talk about your weaknesses. In this video, I've talked about my weaknesses. My willpower when it comes to diet 
was never that good. I've improved on it over time, but it's still something which is something I need to be conscious of. So it would be great if you guys shared some of the things which you're currently working on, not just your successes. Right, I will call it there. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit me up for coaching if you're interested, and I'll speak to you in the next one. Peace out.